Hey guys, Trong here. Thanks for dropping by my channel, Do More. Now, Do More is all about uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, being an investor, and being the best person that you can be. Now, today I spoke to a very old friend of mine named Mac Chung Lin. She's the founder and group chief executive of Nando's in Malaysia and also Singapore. She gets really down and dirty with the operations, but she also shows a very personal side with her family and how she treats her children and how she balances the whole thing between motherhood, uh, family, and the business. So I hope you enjoyed this interview. Uh, you will enjoy this interview as much as I did um, making it. Um, so if you do like it, uh, please share it, like it, and tell me what you think in the comment box below. Thank you. Mac Chung Lin. Hi Chuan. Nando's, founder, group CEO, right? Founder, group CEO, yes. Wow, okay, so they, it's been about 22 years? Yeah, 20, 20, 21 years to be exact. 21 actually. years, yeah, because yeah. I remember your first outlet opened in Bangsa. 1990. Big, big outlet, right? And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Tried it for the first time, amazing. Blew my mind. And bim, bam, boom, here we are, 21 years later. So let's rewind all the way back, right? Yep. Let's rewind all, let's go back and okay. start at the start. Okay. How did it start? Okay, so um, I, I'm an architect by profession, used to work in London, and a really good friend of mine took me to go and eat Nando's in Putney, where I used to live. Um, loved it, but it, in those days, it was that funny chicken place that catered to all the non-English people in, in London at that time. So anyway, we absolutely loved it, and, and we used to eat it with Thai sticky rice. One of the particular trips that my dad came over, I took him to eat it. And he fell in love with it because at that time, you know, fast food in Malaysia was really just catered around burgers and fried chicken. So suddenly you have this like healthy option of grilled chicken with four different flavors and that extra hot flavor that made you sweat. And my dad fell in love with it. And he said, you know, how about us taking this on? And I was like, you're mad. I'm literally just finished seven years of architecture, just got my professionals, was doing my two years in London working experience then. Um, but I didn't think it would ever take. So anyway, he came back um, and he wrote to South Africa. And within two months, my dad was flying over to South Africa. No kidding. Yeah, so it was really, really fast. But the funniest thing is at that particular time, 1998, there were only eight Nandas in UK. Now, to put things into perspective, 20 years later, it's 300 restaurants or more, right? In the so UK. In the UK. So in those days, it really was an unknown brand. So they started all their restaurants in the periphery areas, you know, your, your Ealing Broadways and your, you know, your Putneys and whatever else, none in central London. So it really was a not known brand at that time. And my dad went on his gut instinct that it was just really really good chicken so anyway um within that two months we were writing to them my dad was flying over to them they came over to vet the family um there were a few families that were vying for it a few other companies um somehow through the way they met my family and my dad um quite an interesting story so everybody was quite established all all the other people who were interested in it and we just listed at that time uh, my dad's business and they came into the company um, my dad said would you like some tea and they said yes please we would love some Chinese tea so my dad just pulls out a flask from under the table and pours, pours um, the, the owner's father and the international operations guy a cup of tea they come over from South they Africa they come over from South Africa to Kuala Lumpur to Kuala Lumpur it was um, and they came to our factory and they thought, right, you know, public listed company, we sure have the tea girls and whatever else. And um, that old fashioned pulls out <laughs> this flask and pours it. But apparently that was what really tipped it because at the end of it, everybody else was also financially savvy. Um, at that time, I think all of us didn't have any food experience. So, you know, all things alike, they looked at then the chemical chemistry fit as such um, and 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 the family who own Nandas to this day um, are very down to earth so they will turn up in their trainers they they wear jeans um, they would just the owner was talking at the great um, the restaurant conference in Singapore last week and you know he still swears on stage and you know it's a it's a very nice casual environment still owner operated but as we've grown, of course, we've had to put processes and things in as such. So anyway, so um, got a franchise. I got my professionals. I'm RIBA. And I put in my resignation. And I remember walking with one of the guys from one of the architects from my practice. And he said, well, where are you going to? I said, oh, I'm going back home and I'm going to go and start a chicken restaurant. Um, <laughs> you know, the one on Upper Richmond Road. He said, what? That funny looking one? 
but things how things have changed you know i mean in that 20 years the brand has just gone to such a different level um so it's been really fun it's been a fun and adventure as such you know in my mind i thought that you were the one who approached um south africa i thought that you were the kind of like the, the genesis of it all but it was actually max senior yes it was actually max senior but okay. actually what happened was so anyway he so he calls me up and goes right you've got the franchise we've got the franchise do you and want then, to do this so then off you go you run it wow so it was kind of an i call myself an accidental entrepreneur in the sense that what do we know about food, right? Yeah. Okay, fine. You give me this challenge, I will take it up. Um, but I really didn't think it was going to be a long-term thing. I thought I could just come, start it up. Very naive, right? I was 25. So I thought I could just come back, start it up, and hand it over to whoever it was. But of course, once you start something, there's no such thing as giving it off again, right? And it, it's your baby and you just want to take it on. So 21 Maybe. years later. Have you tried talking to your dad in the last few years about what was going through his mind when he went through this and approached South Africa? And then did he want you to become an entrepreneur? Did he not want you to become an employee? Did he want you to have your own business? I, th I think at that point, we had just listed he wanted some diversification. I think it was an opportunity for him to also bring his daughter back from England. I was ah, in England so, so, quite happily, so, so. quite happily going to get married. My, husband, my fiance at that time had just proposed. So it was, he was quite... It was quite clever, right? Oh, he he brought me back home and gave me an opportunity to run my business. Um, and so, yeah. But food was very, very new to the family. Uh, yeah. You know, we're quite yeah. a construction family as such. That's know? right. Yeah. It still is, right? With yes. your family yeah. business. Yeah. Um, so in the early years, kind of been easy, right? Okay, the financial um, supply notwithstanding, operationally, how difficult was it? I was, I was quite lucky in the sense that... Um, they, they appointed an international operations guy and we actually offered to take him on for two years in Malaysia. So we had that help from an operational background. So from South, South Africa, Africa I so see. we had a South African guy based here. The other thing is when you start out as a first restaurant, you do every single thing yourself, right? So you get to do the marketing, you do the back of house operations, you learn every single thing. So, you know, to this day, when I walk into a restaurant, people try to fib me that the machine's working or not working. You know, because you've worked every single station, right? Um, when you start a restaurant, I mean, you, you have people complaining. You had to deal with customers. Um, you had to deal with people turnover. Um, every single thing, right down to why is the chicken pink, you know? And, and that's got to do with um, um, quality of water and everything. And so, you know, everything you get to know. Um, but it was hard because I, I was very young and I thought that we, what we could do um, was to work in partnership. So I had a guy who was managing the financial side. So he took care, one, one of the guys that was seconded from my dad's company, took care of um, HR, finance. Um, I took care of the marketing and operations, well, kind of a bit of everything. And then Boot was operations as such. But any decision that we made was done in unison. And then one day, our partners came over South Africa. So we were 70%, the Mac family, and they were 30%. Okay, so they take equity in the local business they as well. They took equity. Wow, so they were really interested in okay. the Malaysian. They, they thought that Malaysia could be a stepping stone into the rest of Southeast Asia as such. Did that turn out to be the case? Yes. Uh, well, so far, we've only got Singapore. Okay. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it later. But basically, in the last three years um, or two years, they've now bought into more into the business so we're now 51 49 um, okay, partnership okay, okay. because they really do see that southeast asia will be the next stepping stone in the future and they're right in saying um that. and and because we've got quite a big central support structure or head office structure we it would make sense to use this as a platform for expansion as such so a lot of entrepreneurs um at the very start <clears throat> they cite a financial um, constraints as one of the biggest challenges. Did you ever have that or did you not because you had a listed co behind you? Um, so we work independently from the listed co. So we, it's, it's a private entity. Um, but knowing that you had a support was good. However, we expanded too fast. So, so if I had to go through the challenges and, and the failures as such or the learnings that I had in the early days um, was store opening, right? So Everyone wants a glamour of opening more than one restaurant. And you speak to any new yeah. restaurateur now, they go, I got two, I got three, now suddenly I got ten, right? But what happens is, 
landlords are constantly chasing you to open in their their shopping centers or sites, whatever it is. And you think, wow, I can have one here, I've got another one, and suddenly I've got 10. But we hardly did any analysis and numbers and things. It was all gut feel. You walked along, you see lots of people, you think, perfect, right? Mm. But you don't realize that from Bangsa Telawi, our first restaurant, we opened Subang Parade, which was still a middle income place. Then we opened Chinatown, yeah, central of KL, still okay. But our four, fifth, six, seven, we started going out into Churras, we going, started going out into Kaichang because you think now you can't go too close. You think you can go into the outskirts. Um, but then the person that lives in Churras and Kaichang and all that has never ever heard of, of Nandas before. A lot of the people who knew Nandas in the early days knew it from Australia, funny enough, not from the UK. Okay. So people who had studied in Australia knew Nandas. And that's where, you know, we, we really started our, our platform of people as such, our early adopters. Uh, but then when we started going out into the outskirts, they, they were more price sensitive. They didn't quite understand what was a fast casual. The other thing that was also given to us was we were a table service. But if you look at UK and the rest of the world, it's something called hosted cockerel, right? So you go to the counter, you order and the food's delivered to you. So in the UK, it's that format in Australia as well. They decided to give us a table service, but the counter was 50% of the restaurant. So it, it created a lot of um, confusion in terms of where we stood from a positioning point of view. And then because the food's cooked to order, you were deemed slow. And because our pricing was slightly higher than fast food boys in those days, we were deemed expensive. So talking about cash, it, you start with enough money, but when you realize you're not having enough of the cash flow um, in terms of sales and all that, you do have contractors coming knocking oh, you. Sure, you you sure. have all those things. And I was very, very lucky. I had that strong finance guy who was able to manage it. But you can only last for a certain amount of years. And I think within three years, we realized we had done, you know, we'd expanded too fast. Um, we'd opened in the wrong locations. Um, and we decided we would consolidate everything. We shut down quite a few um, and basically started from almost sort of a few base restaurants again. And that's when our South Africans, I was very lucky that the guy who was the international director then was almost my mentor. Every three months he would come in and he would sit me down with the PNL and go, what are the financial drivers? What are your GPs? What are your... Um, key drivers as such what's the percentage of rent what's the percentage of food costs and everything and wow. to this day I've got all those numbers and percentages drummed in so much that I can look at a PNL. I can question the team very very quickly but it was wow. great that I had him there and he also he was very good strategically and he basically said right you can no longer just look at site selections like that right you really really need to understand who are the people who use Nandos are they he used to say, do they have green hair or do they have red hair? And I mean, you go and look at, at the, the, the different sites. Are there enough green people, green haired people who are eating none, who would be your potential customers? And then from there... So, so what, what's a green hair or red hair? <laughs> so, so for instance, we're a middle income, um, 25 to 45 year olds, right? But are you, you know... Do you eat Nandos or are you a transient? Are you using Nandos as a destination? So understanding how people use different restaurants in different locations was one. So that was one of the, the things. The other thing was also knowing what your competitors did. And it was quite easy to actually find out what your competitors did in terms of sales per location. And from there, you could how, then how gauge... How do you assess that? Just, just anecdotally? Yeah. You know what, from all, your, from all your... You could do it observationally. So you could go into a restaurant and you could literally sit in a restaurant and count how many customers count, yeah. they have. That's right. Um, the other thing that we always used to, to do was also count the amount of people that walked past our restaurants and how many actually came in. So that was the drop-in rate as well. So from there, you could then go into a new site and say, right, the amount of people who walk past, that's like a Maluri kind of restaurant, drop-in rate would be 10%. It's a a drop-in rate of 30% or whatever. So we became a bit more methodical. The other thing is also, you also have a lot of um, staff who were from McDonald's, KFC, Pizza Hut, and everything else, right? So you slowly build up a database of their sales numbers. And you now know as a percentage of sales of 
McDonald's, you are maybe 50% off Pizza Hut, you maybe do 30% higher, or Kenny Rogers, you might do 30%. So you, you eventually work a gauge of the kind of levels in terms of projection of sales. And then by the time you go into, you, you get offered a new site, you can go, there's a McDonald's, there's a Pizza Hut or whatever yeah. in that location, and you can do a projection of sales from there as well. So that is really getting quite method. So you try and isolate all those duds because in site location, you can never get it 100%, of course. Correct. But you try and get rid of as many uncertainties as you can. So wow. we slowly got a bit better in that. Um, so, so that's how we learned. Um, the other thing that was really good also about having a, a mentor as such or a partner was they, they really challenged me over the years in when to step back, when to put the right people in and things. Because, you know, now mentoring a lot of young accelerators and young entrepreneurs, the biggest fear is always stepping back. Do I lose control? Can I trust people? And how do I recruit the right people, right? So working through JDs, when was it time to step back? Job descriptions. Yeah, job descriptions. Um, what is the type of people that you need to suit your your number of restaurants? Um, how many do you need for the next five years of growth, knowing that you're going to grow 10, 15 restaurants? How are you going to structure it? What's the type of person that you need from a marketing point of view? And and it, they were hard, hard conversations because, you know, in an ideal world, especially for Asians, we like to grow people with us, right? We want people that have been with us from 20 years ago that will succeed with us. And you see it in a lot of all the older companies. They've had their their people, all the, the dads and everything have had all their, their people working with them for 20, 30 years and get the next generation coming in and they struggle with, with that. But we've, we've basically had a look at this at quite strategic times in the business, maybe at 20 restaurants, maybe at 40 restaurants, maybe at 60 restaurants, have the people we got, um, are they suited to carry us on for the next 10 years of our business or next five years as such? Um, and, and so I had to step back. I think the first time I stepped back, I brought um, a professional. I wasn't quite ready to relinquish the role of CEO. So I brought in a CEO and she was very good in helping me put in systems and processes. So I think as an entrepreneur, we also need to acknowledge what are our strengths as well. So I'm very good operationally. I'm very good with people. I'm quite good from a, a big perspective. I'm terrible with the paperwork and I'm terrible with it chasing up. So, you know, you want to implement KPIs. You go for all this training, balance scorecards and everything else. But somebody's got to be in the background yeah, to follow up. Yeah. yeah, to follow up, right? Because we're so busy. We're day to day. We're running, you know, by then, I don't know, 30, 40 restaurants. You're, you're all over the place. But if you don't have that person in the back helping you, push you, you're never ever going to implement all these kind of processes. And she was great for me for that. Um, and, and she just put all these pieces in. Um, and then I think about five years ago, I finally stepped back um, and started relinquishing the CEO role. Um, that was hard for me as well. Really, really hard because, you know, to let go of your baby completely, sometimes you think, is it because I'm not good enough, right? Um, and as when you've got partners as well, you, you can't. So at that particular point in time, Nandas decided that they were going to... Um, they were going to bring in a group CEO and he was tasked in deciding or in check in making sure that the right management were in place in all the different countries. And so all of us were management ex assessed. And thankfully, I rated platinum with the top 2,000 CEOs in our database. So, okay, I've got nothing to prove, right? Okay, you're <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm actually quite happy. I've spent so many years working. Um, I haven't had time to spend a lot of time with my kids. Um, and I thought, okay, you know, maybe it is the right time for me to step back and things. But even then at that beginning, the first three years, I still was, I still sat in on some meetings. I still wasn't ready to let go. And it's really been in the last year that I've really said, right, enough is enough. I need to let go. I'm, I'm hiring all these good, you know, CEOs in place. Um, and I need to allow them to be able to, to perform and, and do things their way as well. What did you think um, were the characteristics that are most that were most that are the most important to, to you as an entrepreneur? Resilience. Resilience. Yeah. Perseverance. You know, uh, it, 
people give up people give up very very easily now yeah. if things it, will go wrong they it, will go wrong on a daily basis every single day something will happen yeah yeah and and the question is how do you deal with it right I've, you know I'm, I'm one of those that thrives on challenges i actually work better when it's when things are not going so well because i actually put things in place and run it when things are kind of going you just you 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 kind of you know you float along and you just kind of do it but sometimes when you've got a challenge it actually makes you do something and gets you a bit more excited resilience though um and if this way doesn't work what's the other way as well because quite often enough um and we, let's talk about restaurants you know so as i said not all restaurants do well you open in a, a site and sometimes it takes a long time bangsa village was one of them when we first started we did fifty thousand ringgit sales and it was painful. It was bleeding at that time. You know, it was the it's first shopping. Now. It's flying now, but it took three years for us to turn that restaurant around. So much so that we actually considered cutting down the space, and we were talking to you know um, our landlords about how can we do that. But it it's about working, you know, the customers one customer at a time. So what we do is something called local restaurant marketing, right? And if you're really really diligent, it's literally trying to get chicken into people's mouth and getting them to try because if you don't know what the brand stands for why would you come in because the first thing you see is the pricing we're not the cheapest two it does look quite expensive right so i you know so why would we go and walk in there and we're not a promotional type brand as well so there's nothing that draws them in so we, we tend to when we open a new restaurant what we do now is a community walk and we literally go around the community that 1.53 kilometer radius and invite people to come in and eat at Nandas and get them to sample our chicken. And we find that it takes them probably about two times before they actually convince whether they like Nandas or not. Um, the first time it's kind of free. Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe it was just for show. We'll give them a comeback coupon. They'll come back in that second time. And then that's when they try it and they think, yeah, I do like the experience that I have. But in the early days, literally, um, one street at a time. We literally went and rang doorbells one street at a time. The following week, the next street, the next three years to turn around Bangsa Village. Wow. Yeah. And you, you said you were an accidental, accidental entrepreneur because you were all trained to be an architect and then you somehow got pulled into this business. Um, do you think that you had to literally learn on the job or do you think that you had it always in you to, 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 you know, to handle all the challenges? I think in a way as an architect, you are quite trained to handle multiple disciplines. So mm. one of the things as an architect is you, you don't just work with a client, right? You've got your mechanical, your structural engineer. So you've got quite a broad background. You learn the legalities contracts, you learn, you know, drawings and everything else. And um, so... I think that was quite good. And the other thing that we also had to do, we actually on a weekly basis had to do something called a crit. And you had to stand in front of your tutor and, and of your, your group. Critique, crit. The yeah. critique, yeah. Okay. And you put up your, your drawing and they crit you. Yeah. They literally criticise you. And that's good. And it was good because the resilience and, and the ability to be able to stand up and fight for your thing was quite tough. I mean, God, I hated it. I was a... I think I'm a terrible... I'm... I'm a good practical architect, but I think those early years of trying to design that was tough for me. Really, <laughs> really, really tough for me. But I, th I, I think it gave me a really good foundation. Um, and, and I think maybe also just going away young, I was quite independent, yeah, yeah, you know, in that yeah, sense. Yeah. Um, you know what it's like. We went away when we were twelve, whatever, and and yeah, you, you learn and, to, and you, you learn grow to be skills you, early. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We learned to fight fight for ourselves. We had to do everything ourselves. There's no such thing as running to somebody crying. And really, failure was really not an option. So we just had to do it. Now. So then, so so 1997 was the first branch. How many are you now? So 19, 1997, we started a business. 98 was the first restaurant. Yeah. Um, we're at 79. Wow. In Malaysia and in Singapore, we got eight. Wow. Yeah. So how different is doing business in Singapore? Very different. It's different, right? Very different. And different very market, hard. Right? You know, it's so close, but the culture is so different. So, you know, we thought that going to Singapore was going to be quite easy in the sense that same colour, same type of people. Yeah. Um, and it's literally and it's half, a, it's, it's, it's it's half, half an hour away, yeah, right? Yeah. On, on the causeway, across the causeway. You would think the mindset is all very similar. The chicken goes into Singapore as the cheapest chicken in the world. It's sold to us as the most expensive chicken in the world. So our chicken is 30% in Singapore, 30% more expensive than the chicken in Australia, UK. What? How is that possible? 
that's why Singapore is one of the most expensive countries in the world. So production costs and labor costs is very expensive. Wow. And they buy all the chicken from Malaysia. So it, it's just... So it's, you, you, ba- you literally ship the chicken from Malaysia Well, we don't Singapore. ship it because you deviate there. I mean, yeah. is it deviate? They're, yeah. They, they, they don't allow us to ship it. They will bring the chicken in and chickens are slaughtered in Singapore itself. So the full processing is done in Singapore. But rentals is the other thing that has been very tough for us in Singapore. If in Malaysia, rentals are between sort of 15% average, Singapore is 30%. And, and then you've got this conglomerate of big landlords like your capital land and things, and very non-negotiable as such. So it's been very, very hard for us. From a top line, we're actually doing quite well, but from a bottom line, Singapore is just painful. And, and funnily enough, so when we first started in Singapore, we, we decided that our strategy was to hit the early adopters, right? So now Singapore is um, um, a bridge from Europe down to Australia and things. People travel a lot and yeah. people, it's, it's the entry into the rest of Southeast Asia as well. So it's, it's quite a strategic location for the Nandas group. Um, so the first three were along the Orchard Road Belt and that was very good. Wow. And to this day, um, we still do very well. We're not in Central Orchard Road where it's sort of, you know, Tanglin and we're Plaza Singh. And it's and enough. But it's still, they still yeah, do well. Yeah. But then what we did was we started opening in the outskirts, the heartlands, and it's like going into a different country because you think it's a city state, population sure. of five to six million, but the, the income group, um, household income is completely different. The disparity between the people in that central belt to all the heartlands. And so we, we, we've had to do two lots of strategic turnaround in Singapore because we opened huge, and Singapore loved their novelty, right? So if anything's got a queue, people flock to it. So, you know, they- It's the they, herd instinct, right? Yeah, it, and, and, but Singapore particularly. So the latest one, Shake Shack in Jewel and a the queues are long, massively, massive long. When we open three months of our long queues, Wow. That is how, I mean, we the first restaurant made its money back in six months or less. It, it was just so fast. Oh, yeah. And then we opened our second and third very quickly and they made their money back. And then the rest just bladders. It's just so painful. Wow. Um, but what, one of the things that we, we, we did was to bring in a Singaporean um, GM and she basically said to us, you've got to go halal. So we used to sell, you know, UK style got alcohol and things. Um, in Singapore, not in, in Malaysia in, though. In Malaysia, we, Malaysia no. before they changed the halal, the Jakim laws, you could have individual halal restaurant, ha, individual halal licenses in each restaurant. So we used to have, in Batifringi, we used to have alcohols, oh, yeah? um, oh, Sungai, yeah. uh, not, um, Sungai Wang, but then they changed it so it's a, a platform. Blanket, yeah, yeah, blanket, yeah, blanket yeah. halal. So we took, took it all away. But we also found in Malaysia and Singapore, the syntax is so high that it actually wasn't worth you coming to Nandas and having a wine or just, beer. It was too expensive. It kills you. It was too expensive in relation to your meal. So in the UK, you could have a bottle of wine for £10. Your meals maybe seven, eight pounds right? So proportionately, it's kind of right. Malaysia, the cheapest you could sell your wine, maybe 40, 50 ringgit on the table, right? Your meals maybe no 50. way, not even forty. If, yeah, 50. exactly. It could be like, so like 70, bucks. 80. Yeah, I mean, yeah. those days like when we used to sell, but it, but the disparity is huge. And so people didn't buy wine. The odd beer sold in places like Batufringi, so you had a lot of the tourists. The rest of the places didn't sell. And it was the same in Singapore. Their mindset was, if you're going into a shopping centre to eat, I'm not going to have a beer there. And, and so I guess maybe the culture is slightly different. But then, so, so June, who was our, our Singapore GM, said, you've got to go halal. And actually, a lot of the landlords have been already asking us, and we couldn't understand why. 18% Malay population there. But actually, it's exactly the same as Malaysia. If you and I went out for lunch with our Malay friend, our colleague, he or she would dictate the lunch meal, um, at lunch location. Our sales went up by 50% overnight. No way. Overnight, and settled at about 30%. Bloody and yeah. so in the last strategic turnaround, so it, dipped again after a few years, um, we actually questioned the halal part again in Singapore. And and actually when we did a, we did a whole load of qualitative um, survey, it didn't matter whether you're halal or not. As long as you're in the locations that you were in, it really didn't matter. And so we just kept it as halal because we actually considered bringing back alcohol again in, right, in Singapore. Right, right. But anyway, we've, we've decided um, 
halal it is for now. Yeah. Um, but what we have done was in Singapore, we found that as a brand, we're starting to go a bit fuddy-duddy, a bit too prim and proper. Um, table service, our customer profile was getting a bit old. It was more 30 to 45. Um, if you look in the UK, you have a very young teenage to sort of 25. That's their main target market. Um, and Singapore, we're starting to get quite old people. So in the last year... So, so let's just remember, so why is that a negative? Because you become a fuddy-duddy brand. Okay. You want it to be a bit younger. So Nandas is quite... If you if you look at it around the world, it's quite trendy, right? It's 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 not trendy, but it's 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 a you, brand you that what? resonates with young. It's kind of cool. You get people like Ed Sheeran talking about it. You you know okay. your David Beckham's and whatever else. So it it resonates with the young. And in Malaysia, we're known as a brand that's you know socially um, what's the word Afford, for it? Right? Yeah. Okay. So, it, not, so so, yeah. so but then do you do you balance that with the fact that if you get a younger clientele, they are. The, their spend might not be as high as an older spend. So you have a secondary target market when it comes to marketing, but you also have your secondary, your, your, your primary, uh, your main target and your secondary target. So you, even though you're talking to this particular market, you don't isolate the others. There's still communication out to them as well. I see. So, so even though, um, so we may not necessarily go 15 to 25, for instance, we might go 15 to 30 or whatever it is, but it goes into a wider um, scope. So in Malaysia, we are now getting there where a lot of young are pulling their family in as well. It's quite important because otherwise you just continue growing old. Um, and so Singapore, what we found was it people, so we did a survey um, in terms of pricing, um, where we stood in relation to our customers, I mean to our competitors. Lunch we were very expensive compared to our customers. Dinner time was okay. So people are willing to spend more at dinner, but lunch, they all want cheap, cheap, below $10 and all this kind of thing. So we did a whole lot of things. We decided to change it to host a cockerel. Um, we dropped our pricing. We took away service charge. Um, you now order at the counter. It's that much faster. Um, in the last two months, we've now got online table ordering as well. So you can actually order uh, at the table. Um, pay at the table and it's it's also seamless. So we're moving things quite fast, but it's easy when you've got eight restaurants in Singapore to do those kind of changes. Um, at some stage in Malaysia, we might. It's not on the table at the moment, but um, we, we will look at that in the future. You're very operational, aren't you? you? I mean, you're literally down on your knees and your elbows on the floor doing all the scrubbing with the rest of the guys. You you sound literally like you're still in the trenches. Not really. No? Not you, really. You, I'm, you just really aware, I'm just aware I'm just aware I'm just aware of what's happening, that's all. After 20 it's still years. it's still my business, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've got I've got a great GM in Singapore now, a guy a young guy, he's a twenty nine year old guy. Um, so he's from the UK team and he came on board. He understands the culture of the business. He's young, he brings in a bit more energy and things. Um, and he's been instrumental in converting this, right? Bringing in that energy and that liveliness into the business. So how does an entrepreneur, in, after 20 years, um, how, how has it evolved for you as someone who does business? Has it, has it changed? I, mean, in terms of, I know in terms of the energy for sure, because you might not be as energetic as you were at say 29 or whatever, right? And uh, also the passion. How do you? I, I don't know, right? It's just an <laughs> assumption. You you go through ups and downs. Yeah. You definitely definitely do. So you know, I think in the last year, um, as I stepped out of the business, I I had to find myself again, right? Because if you've been driven for the last twenty years and been so operational, as you said, I really knew what was happening and things. And when you have to let go of your baby and you have to empower your your next in line, your CEOs that you pay lots of money for, and your your you you, you pay good for, you, I mean the guy I've got is ex McDonald's CEO. You know he's the best, and um, I had to allow him to have his space. And but you you step back and you go, ooh, what am I going to do with myself? You know now, mm. I was very lucky in the sense that I then started doing things with. EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. I started working with accelerators, which is like startup entrepreneurs. I, I do a lot of mentoring for them. Um, and what do you tell these guys? So all these things, so I, the <laughs> amount of them who wants mentorship about restaurants and startups right, or, or putting structure in place. Yeah. So because I did a lot of work on structures, um, you know, so I helped them out with how do you put a team together? What is it that you lo need to look for? Um, how, how do you cater for your future expansions or what are the needs? Because quite often enough, they go, oh, I like this person, I like that person, but is that person going to be able to do the work that you need? Um, and how do you have this kind of 
conversations with your team lah as such. Yeah. So are um, there any like overriding uh, messages that you send to these people, or is it really a case by case basis? Are there like broad general principles that apply to all aspiring wannabe entrepreneurs? Okay. So so one of the things that we do um, from EO is in the accelerator program is four different things: cash. Um, people, strategy, and execution. Cash right? is in cold hard cash. Cash can go anything from cash flow um, to cash supply. Yeah, yeah, or recurring income, for instance. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people may have contracts, but they don't have recurring income. They may have one off, but they don't have that. So how do you have like recurring income? One collection is one of the hardest. Um, Anybody who starts their own business will realize that collection and cash flow is one of the biggest. It, it can make or die, um, um, kill your business. And I learned it the hard way. Um, you know, if, if, I, if I wasn't on top of my cash flow, it was very, very fast. Even though we were a cash business, you know, because you're paying for KPEX and things like that, it's still, how yeah. do you make sure that the money flows through? Um, and so I, I spend time with a lot of people on that as well. Um, just. So one is cash, the, the other three? Strategy. Strategy, okay. Yeah. Um, direction, yeah. Direction. Because even strategy, right? Um, everybody starts a business, but they don't actually, sometimes they have no, they're so operational, they have no time to step back and go, right, what is it that I need? My next five years goals are this, or who are my target markets and who am I talking to? And how, so that's strategy. And then the people side, um, people could be anything from culture, to putting the right people in place, to structure, to KPIs, um, and execution was also KPIs as well. Execution is hard. A lot of people can think of strategy, but actually doing. So, you know, um, as I was saying, you open a restaurant and everybody wants to open a restaurant because they, you know, the amount of people come up to us and say, I love cooking. I want to open a restaurant. But they don't realize, one, it's the biggest theft I mean, honestly, people steal from you left, right, and center. If mm. it's not at the cash till, it's from the back of house and the chickens. The chickens walk out the door. Really? Everything walks out the door. <laughs> Crockery, cutlery, whatever oh have you, God. everything customers will walk Customers or staff? Both? Customers. Uh, staff mainly, but you, you, it wow. can be both. It can be both. But customers could be just even though bottle yeah. sauces, you know? Yeah. Um, we have those cute little eggs on... Um, they look like eggs, but they're salt and pepper shakers. Those also go missing. Um, everything goes missing. So, you know, but that you just include into your costs. You accept it's part of business and every business has got pilferage and things. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we allow, I mean, we don't allow, but you know there is and you need to learn to manage it, right? So we have our pl uh, PNPs and SOPs in place yeah, to make sure yeah. that we reduce it as much as possible. But then people realize... Um, so they've started this as a hobby and suddenly they have to work nights because it's yeah. the busiest time. Suddenly they have to work weekends and suddenly they realise they can't find anybody to work for them. And then, you know, Malaysia's clamping down on foreign workers and then suddenly they realise they can't recruit at all. And so they, they go from having a hobby to something they absolutely hate. Um, and it's no longer a passion thing. So how do you put people into place? But recruitment's so hard, right? It's how, What's your brand, your employer brand value and, yeah. and how do you create a value proposition that people do want to come and work. And even after 21 years, we're still constantly talking about this. Wow. And our wow. turnover is still very high, even really? to this day. Yes, very, very high. I've been to your place in uh, one or two, uh, Bangsa Village is one. You've got good people there, you know? Yeah, and, I know. But um, still, even then, it's very, very hard. You yeah, know? And yeah. are we at that level that we yeah. want? So we, we may have better than average, but we think we can still be so much better. So after all these years, um, you've, kind of like taking a step back operationally. Um, have you had time to just analyze what's happened, take stock and, you know, just just really just let it sink in or, or not really? Um, I guess a bit of reflection when you are now mentoring others, yeah, you know, yeah. what you could have done better, what you could not have done. Uh, what, what I think, to be honest, everything's a journey, right? Yeah. Um, you can't do everything correct in the first place. As, as we said, you meet daily hurdles. Yeah. If you hit that challenge, you know, you have to find your way through. Like, I guess that resilience, as I said, is quite important. Yeah. Do you, know, do, do you ever take stock in all this uh, talk nowadays about gender diversity and getting women? So or, we, so, yeah. so Nandas is quite good about that. So Malaysia, yeah. our leadership, so we're talking about leadership through restaurants and our office is 50% women in leadership. Yeah. 
Um, as a concept though, because you've 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 headed the business for twenty years and you are a female, right? Yeah. Has it ever entered your mind that oh, I, I'm a woman and I can do this, or you just do it because you have to do it and you can do it? Do you know what I mean? So I'm saying that people nowadays are very almost too fixated on is he a male or is he a female is he gender is we, we just did it automatically to be yeah. honest because actually to be honest at one point in my leadership team more than 50% were women I just found we had more women I interviewed everybody just yeah. by chance that the women came in more yeah. at the moment um, we're you know it, it, it depends at different stages who you have but it it's never been consciously going out to look for it it shouldn't I think, be right? yeah. it shouldn't I, be I right. think if you're a company that is quite good about it, it's okay. There mm. are some companies who are very biased, um, who will not employ women because they're going to get pregnant and whatever else. We've never been one like that. In Singapore, we employ ex-offenders, right? So we work at Changi Prison oh, under good. a program called SCORE, um, or Yellow Ribbon, they call it. Do you find these guys are more hungry, more determined to make so an it's impact? Not, it's, not, um, it's not so much about hunger for impact, but basically... Um, Interestingly, June, this Singaporean GM that I had before, she brought it in and she said to me, will you allow me to talk about it? Because they, CAG, uh, not CAG, Changi Prison wants us to talk about it. And, and, in the press? And, in the press and talk and, and tell people that we're, we're doing it. And I said, of course, you know. Yeah, um, yeah of course. I'm very happy with it. Because in her previous company, she wasn't allowed to talk about it because their fear was if the people, the parents of the staff found out that they were working next to an ex-offender or prisoner, oh. they wouldn't want them to work with them. And what would a perception of, come of your customers be if they know that they're being served by a prisoner? But because we've never treated... But what kind of prisoner is If you're an ex-murderer, a different thing. Yes. But you know what I mean, right? Yeah, so we, we tend to get petty theft, petty drugs, ah. or whatever it yeah, is in, yeah. in Singapore. Um, but we've never, ever had an issue of, of um, people not working together. Um, at any one point, we've got about 30 ex-offenders working for us. Only in Singapore? In though? Singapore, yeah. Interesting. And it's been really, really good. And it guarantees us at least, because they, it's in their last six months of probation, right? So they yeah. come through. It gives them an opportunity to start going back into into society as well and giving them a second chance. And so that's something that we work very well with in Singapore. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, diversity, um, could we be, be better on a, um, um, from a racial, probably. Um, we're still quite diverse in that sense. Yeah. Um, we don't have any foreign workers working for us in Malaysia. We're 100% Malaysian so you know something you that we're pay more for that right it's yeah yeah so so we're, we're very proud of the fact that we're 100% Malaysian um, and and it's something that we work towards all the time it's hard work it's very very hard work yeah yeah what's the difference between working with a foreign worker and a local worker is, is, is that it's not meant to be any to be honest um, so so we do have foreign workers in the rest of the world. So even in Singapore, you have to, right? There's no yeah. way you're going to get Singaporeans yeah. there. Um, but you're, you're meant to treat them all equally. So we have something called the Nandoka deal that we've signed all around the world. So if anybody who works for Nandos is called a Nandoka, you are treated equally. Nando, Nandoka. N Nandoka, yeah. Okay, Nandoka. Okay. Yeah, Nandoka. So everyone's supposed to be treated the same. But no. in, in, in different country structure, it depends on your, you know, whether you're outsourced or whatever. So in, in a Malaysian context, it's very, very hard to recruit um, foreigners under your own work permit, right? And as you know, outsourcing is not legal anymore in Malaysia, so we don't do that as well. In Singapore, the structure is we have got quite a diverse um, crowd of, of population. So you, for And they've got a quota system in Singapore. So for every one Singaporean, you might be able to allow for every two Singaporeans, you might be allowed one Malaysian, for instance. Yeah. Um, so it really depends on different country and different nuances as such. So I've got to ask you, right? So, um, you know, if, if today, 2019, you're given the opportunity to start an F&B F business, would you do it? Or would you just like, is it too I hard have, now? So if you had asked me that a year ago, I would have told you no. Definitely, definitely no. I yeah. was tired. Um, it does take a lot out of you. It's for so how? Yeah, okay, go but, on. Now, I'm at that stage where if I had to, I would probably want to buy into a company that is already established, so I don't have to start from scratch. That starting is very hard because you I want can't... want the footprint already. I would like at least 
an existing crew of people working. I don't have to go and recruit from scratch. Um, there is a bit of a brand there that I can develop more. Um, because to start everything from scratch, that, that startup branding, to put a team together is very, very hard. I cannot tap from the Nanda's um, team because that's a JV structure Correct. that needs to work independently. So if I had to start again, I would have to start from scratch again. So from a personal standpoint, because you know, obviously in the last 20 years, it's, it, it's also been the most um, important from your family's perspective. You've got, you got children, you've got a husband as well. Um, were there sacrifices? Must have been, De- right? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, how, how if, you if you have your own business, you have got the flexibility of saying, I've got a parents-teachers meeting, I'm going to go at lunch. Or I've got a sports meeting, I'm going to go. But realistically, I travelled a lot. Um, yeah. I wasn't around for a lot of things. And you always got meetings and your head's not always 100% at That's home. That's right. So, and we're a 365-day-a-year till 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock type business. Theoretically, it's an all day 365. Yeah, right? it's 24-7. So there's definitely sacrifices. <clears throat> and that's why when when that opportunity came for me to step back, I knew it was right. It's very hard from a personal ego to mm, say, mm. let go completely. Mm. And I think in that last year, I was able to then say, it's time. I was tired, you know. And it's not fair in the business when you're tired and you're no longer being productive with the team. And, it, and and I really wanted to be able to spend time with my kids then. They are now at, you know, teenagers. They're going to go away soon. And it was time, time to, to, to really give back to my family. Yeah, because zero to 10 years old, I've got children as well. Zero to 10 years old, they're very demanding. And this is idea that between, say, the ages of seven to 13, that's when their personalities are truly formed. Um, and if the parent is not around at that time, that that formation of that psyche is outsourced to the school or to the maid or to the yeah. caretaker or we, whatever. We were very strict. So every putting to bed is us. Every waking up is us. Every weekend, no maids is involved. So we, we had to really make the effort. Yeah. And if we were going around sites, looking at sites or looking at restaurants, they came with us, you know. So Sean, my husband's an architect. So if you he, he was going to site to check out one of our restaurants, our kids grew up playing in the sand and, you know, getting used to all that kind of environment. So you do adapt it, yeah. but there are definitely sacrifices. Do you talk to your kids about doing business and do you pass on any other ethos uh, to them? We Not try really? to at the moment. I think they... They just see us as the nagging mummy, you know. Do you know who I am and why is the chicken not good enough at the uh, moment? And that's it. Do you, I mean, um, you know, so obviously entrepreneurial families, they, they, it's always business at family, yeah. you know, dinners, right? Is does does that happen or we are you do, to we it? do, but we try not to enforce that, and also knowing that. Nanda's may not necessarily be a yeah. next gen type business. Yeah, it it yeah. might still be within the family, but it's always going to be a corporate type structure. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've not pushed it, but one child has expressed interest in entrepreneurship and wanting to run oh, her yeah? own business. One has said that possibly following daddy's line of architecture. One still don't know what yet. So, you know, it really, really does depend what um, the individual child is. What's been your style of parenting? Oh, I don't know. I think... <laughs> is that... Has it been a style? I, I would like to have believed I was quite open and allowed them to have their own thoughts. Yeah. But I, I realised in the last year, okay, maybe they do, do need to go to boarding school and have their own freedom now. <laughs> <laughs> and because, I don't know. I, I, I think they've grown up as good kids. Yeah. Um, I would like them to be a bit more independent. And I think... And maybe that's comparison against us. Because we went away so young, we did everything on our own. But now, we mollycoddle our kids so badly. I mean, really, really mollycoddle them. Even though they travel and they do all their sports competitions and everything else. But we provide for them, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and how do you pull back to allow them some space as well? I think that's a, a big challenge for us parents, I think. It's interesting because you've been so busy with the business, but yet you've been you, you've quite still hands-on. been able to be quite hands-on. Yeah. So it seems almost impossible that you can be hands-on in the business and hands-on with your children um, be because you cannot. But, the, but, but, it's but it sacrifices, yeah? So, so when I was really full-on, so before my 40s, I was full-on business and full-on kids. There was no social life. 
So, so sleep, see, obviously. Sleep, you go to sleep early. You know, there's no. I mean, if we have a glass of wine or drinks, it's at home. The, yeah. My husband and I will open our bottle of wine and we'll have that, right? But yeah. there's no such thing as going up because the next morning you get woken up by your Boom. child yeah. at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, right? So it's early morning start. Um, but really, it was sacrifices. It, and, and it was personal sacrifices as well. So it was not about you. So I didn't start doing my exercise again until I started at 10, 40. That's when wow. the kids were independent and things like that. So that... 30 to 40s was quite hard on It's full on. Yeah, it's full on. full on. Yeah. When you talk to like accelerators, especially women right now, because I think there's been a real upsurge of female entrepreneurs, right? Especially among the millennials. What do you tell them? Do you tell them to make a choice between motherhood or parenthood and, and business? No, I tell them they can have everything. You can have? <laughs> yeah. Really? I always Is tell them. Is that unrealistic? I, no. We, we have beautiful kids who are doing well academically, who are able. And, and as an entrepreneur, you can choose, right? you are allowed to manage your own time. And I think that's a real advantage of being an entrepreneur. You can manage your time, but you have to be disciplined and you have to be able to plan. Uh, so if you know you're going to be traveling, you need to work out every single day, right? Who's picking up kids, who's not picking up kids, who's whatever, lah, you know, every single yeah. day, your meals have to be planned. Our shopping for food is every weekend to make sure that the food's ready for the whole week. We, you know, so all those things need to be planned. And and also, I mean, you've got to have a very supportive husband. I've been very, very lucky. Yeah, that's the other thing because typically the roles are reversed. It's the male who's the entrepreneur and the female is in the supporting role. Yeah. Yours, I presume, and I could be wrong, is the, it's flipped over well, the other Well, no, way. I mean, Sean always had his business as well, but I've been very lucky that he's been very supportive of me if I'm traveling and he's there. He's also a very hands-on father as well. So I think that also helps. Um, you know, if you, if you had a husband who wasn't hands-on, then you're very Difficult. dependent on your maid and yeah. then, you know, it's a very different dynamics as such. But, you know, it, it's each, I've, I've learned not to judge. Each family is completely different. Completely, completely different. What works for you doesn't, may work, may not work for another person. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I think the hardest part, I remember one person actually saying to me, um, how is it that Chung is so close to the family and this woman who, who doesn't work actually said that it really hurt me and I was like you know the amount of personal sacrifice that we make as women in business women, working huge. women is huge at your own personal cost because yeah. you can't work out yeah. you can't get to socialise uh, all these things it's right? just pure family or work and yeah. that's it Yeah, yeah. It's, been, it's a binary decision and that's yeah. it Yeah. Wow. so when we turned 40 it was like okay that's it you kids are old enough I'm going to do my own thing um so, so how has life changed? Because you and I are same vintage, right? Yeah. I, I certainly feel the beans, okay? I'm not going to out your age, no mind. <laughs> but uh, things have changed from when we were 20 years ago, right? I do a lot of yoga. Yeah. Um, I work out maybe five times a week, five to That's six times. Yeah. That's so, and, and so my mornings will start with that. Um, yeah. I'm doing something called Wujikong, which is like a type Wujikong of... is interesting. Uh, yeah, but it's a Wujikong, so it's active meditation, yeah. right? So it's quite, it's, it's, it's like one of the offshoots. Like. So it's been quite good. Um, and then traveling a lot more with, with Sean yeah. Yeah. as well. Just, I think the, with, the, just the two of you without the kids? We try to do it with kids as well. Um, okay. But slowly, one by one, they're slowly going away. So now wow. Sean, Sean and I, over the next year, we'll have to become empty nesters. And wow. that's when... Yeah. How old are your kids? 16, 15, 15, yeah. Wow, yeah, four so. more years and then mm. they're like in university. And two then, more years, university. Or oh, two more years, 17? 18. 18, 18, 18 shit, yeah. man. Yeah. Scary, right? Time right? Fly, right? Mm, exactly. Does the passage of time scare you? It does. Do you know it what does, I mean? It does. Because it's just like, it does. like that, right? It does. Because I think suddenly it's, we've, we've gotten used to life as it is. Yeah. And over the next three, two years, it's going to change dramatically. Yeah. Um, so how are you preparing for that? Don't know yet. I, <laughs> you know, I actually, I actually had to go and see somebody because um, I was a bit lost when I stepped back. And yeah, I yeah, say, yeah. what's my life purpose, right? And yeah, this, yeah. This, this guy was one of those, you know, talking about life purpose and things. And, and he said, why are you so interested in the destination? Your journey is part of your discovery as well. So it's quite a change in mindset. Interesting. But, but you know, we're so driven when you've been working five-year goals and three-year goals for the last 15 years it's always there's a destination to hit too right there's always a budget to hit there's always a whatever and then your kids exam at the end of the year so there's always something and suddenly it's like where's our next destination so we don't yeah. quite know i am at a stage where I'm, i am saying 
maybe it's time to look at something else. So it would be it a business or whatever. I haven't decided. So I kind of feel business. I don't know. <laughs> is it business giving back or what? I'm ready for something. I don't know what it is yet. So I'm still on that journey. But I think coming soon. I don't know. Let's see. Interesting, man. Interesting. Um yeah. Look, I mean, we've got a few more minutes left, but I just want to get your thoughts on on on, on maybe um, what it all meant, you know, um, how how life has taken this turn, you know. Uh, I, I personally believe that everything is predetermined, so there's an element of karma to it. Um, how you, how everybody is now and where everybody is now is, is no accident. So even though you train as an architect, you ended up as a basically a chicken salesperson. Yeah, I know. Right? A chicken yeah. purveyor. And there's no accident, I think. Um, so, I don't know. Have you ever tried, have you ever sat late at night and just analyzed and, and just trying to make sense of what's going on? Uh, or are you not? I don't know about the comic thing, but I think it's just been, I've, 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 I do believe hard work pays. You know, there's no yeah. such thing as... No such thing, yeah. There's no such thing as e- an easy option. You do have to work for what you want. Yeah. Um, and definitely the last 21 years it's not been everyone thinks oh Nanda's you've done so well and everything but you know what it's been hard work really yeah. really really hard work hard yards right hard it's it's on the ground it's working the people it's and it's hours yeah. it's time commitment it, you know you, you can now yes you've got technology and things like that but really Working with people is about time. It's about spending time and talking to people and getting your people to be on the same page as you. Three years ago when my business, you know, I, we had a bit of a downturn with the Malaysian business. And, and when I stepped back into the business again, I had to turn around the business in nine months wow. from a negative 11% percent um, like for like year on year sales. I managed to turn it around in just nine months. So that by the time you know Stephen came on board, my McDonald's CEO, I was able to hand him a, a, a business that was good, you know, zero percent for you to build the base up to. And it took a lot of just motivating them and saying, "Are you on a journey with me?" And you know, how do I bring you on this journey with me? And it's it's always working with them and getting them on your side because if you got people going in a different direction, you're going here. There's no point. You're just fighting people all the time. Um, so it's a lot of effort. It's time going around restaurants, eating chicken, you know, and, and tasting food and just knowing what's happening. But it's been a blast, right? It's been fun. I wouldn't have, I, you know, if you ask me again, would I do it again? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You yeah. loved it, right? I did, I did, I did. I absolutely yeah. loved it. I don't think I could ever do architecture. <laughs> definitely not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very thank much. You, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.